Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this special event at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. My name is Benjamin Gadan. I am the acting director of the Wilson Center's Latin American program. I am delighted to welcome our guest today, Colombia's defense minister, Diego Molano. Bienvenido. Welcome to the Wilson Center. Welcome to everyone who's joining us today for this important conversation. Minister Molano was appointed to his position last year in 2021. Previously, he had served as the director of the administrative department of the Presidency of the Republic, where he was promoting alternative development programs in rural areas affected by violence throughout Colombia. He has also served as a councilman in Bogota, the Colombian capital, and as director of the Bavaria Foundation, among other various important roles. Colombia, as you know, is one of the most important U.S. security partners in the Americas. Just this March, Colombia was named a major non-NATO ally of the United States. It is the only NATO global partner in the region, a program that helps assure the interoperability of Colombia's forces with those of NATO members. As it has for decades, the United States continues to support Colombia's armed forces in many areas. That includes a new mission known as Artemis that I know is important to you, Minister Molano, and that we will discuss during today's dialogue. Artemis is designed to support Colombia's environmental protection, including the reduction of deforestation and illicit mining, which in many cases are linked to the activities of criminal organizations and have immensely negative consequences for Colombia's forests and bodies of water. Colombia's armed forces have taken on this new environmental challenge amid a range of other daunting responsibilities. These include confronting criminal groups known as Grupos Armados Organizados, and that threaten public safety throughout the country through violence and illicit activities, including narcotics trafficking. Just recently, the Clan del Golfo attacks in northern Colombia have underlined the country's complex security conditions. At the same time, Colombia's forces are attempting to increase territorial control and make it possible for civilian agencies to reach communities that have long been excluded from critical national development initiatives. As if the minister's agenda was not complicated enough, he's also overseeing the modernization of Colombia's security institutions to address new and rising challenges, such as cybersecurity, and to prepare for potential threats in the future, including from outside Colombia's borders. Given these weighty issues and the close relationship between our two countries, I'm thrilled about today's special conversation between the defense minister and our former ambassador to Colombia, Michael McKinley, Ambassador McKinley, as everyone knows, served as the U.S. top diplomat in Colombia from 2010 to 2013. He had previously served as U.S. Ambassador to Peru. He has also served as our ambassador in Afghanistan and Brazil and is the senior advisor to the U.S. Secretary of State. Ambassador McKinley, I want to turn this conversation over to you for a dialogue with Minister Molano. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. And uh, Benjamin, thank you very much uh, for those kind opening words. And Mr. Minister, terrific to see you again, and certainly a uh, pleasure to welcome you in your new capacity, not so new now, uh, after almost a year as Minister of Defense. You'll allow me to say I knew your successor well, uh, your predecessor well. Uh, he was a close friend, Carlos Holmes Trujillo, but uh, you know, certainly was very glad to see your name put forward and uh, to follow uh, the work you've been doing on a whole range of issues over the past year. And I know this is uh, going to be your last visit to the Washington as uh, Minister of Defense, and uh, there are many issues on the agenda. I see you've already met with uh, the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, Senator Jack Reed, the ranking member of the Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Marco Rubio, an indication of the bipartisan support there is for Colombia in this city. Uh, but you're also arriving at a moment when you're promoting a very significant new initiative. Uh, as Benjamin mentioned, uh, the uh, Proyecto Artemisa. And I know you'll be speaking with administration officials about this very ambitious plan to support environmental protection, combat illegal logging, uh, building out and protecting the 59, count them, national parks inside Colombia. And certainly Colombia's efforts, uh, which we saw at COP26, to accelerate meeting the timetable of net zero emissions and to expanding regional cooperation on uh, environmental protection is setting an example for the region. So perhaps we could open uh, with you explaining in uh, some greater detail uh, what this project, 
uh, has in mind and how you're looking at it moving forward strategically into the next government? Well, first of all, I would like to thank the Wilson Center and Mr. Geddon for giving us the opportunity of being with you here, uh, taking into consideration the long relationship between the United States and Colombia. And as you mentioned before, how through this process, I will say that in the year 97, Colombia was mentioned in some journals as a failed state. And thanks to the U.S. aid at that, at that time, but also the Plan Colombia, uh, now we have a stronger democracy. We have a state and an armed forces and a police that has been strengthened during the last years uh, with the ability to combat uh, narco traffic, to strengthen our capacities and to provide a very firm efforts in order to defend the values of the democracy, of the private sector, of freedom, and to ensure the sovereignty of our territories. And this has been done thanks to the cooperation of the United States. We are very proud of this co uh, strong cooperation and how this has helped our armed forces in Colombia as a regional provider for security and for uh, coming together with other countries in order to combat this uh, uh, threat that is narco traffic. Uh, having the opportunity here to explain some of this achievement, but the, the new initiative, as such as Artemis, is I'm really proud and honored of being here again, and I would like to thank this opportunity. I will say that one of the new issues that is emerging in the international agenda is about climate change. President Duque, uh, when he enacted his uh, development plan, defined that water biodiversity uh, must be an uh, asset to be protected by the military forces and the police. Uh, based on this intention and this new objective, we decided three years ago to modify some of our military and police operation under this umbrella of the Artemis campaign. Um, in Colombia, around 200,000 hectares of the tropical forest are deforestated in a year, uh, mainly because narco traffic, because in the case of Colombia and in the Amazon, which is uh, behind the deforestation is narco traffic activities in the planting of illegal crops in the destruction or the, of rivers through the contamination with the laboratories where the cocaine is produced. The second largest factor is uh, illegal cattle rendering. Uh, and of course, other uh, illegal activities as, as would illegal um, trade. Therefore, we decided to go in an initiative in order to accomplish three major objectives, is how to stop deforestation because it's uh, not um, allowed for any country now in, in, in these times of uh, how to control climate change to allow this type of, of uh, accelerated deforestation. 200,000 hectares per year is more or less uh, three times the size of the New York City uh, destroyed in the jungle, in our tropical forest. That's why we decided to go for a campaign with military operations that go after those who are deforestated, that in the case of Colombia are the illegal armed groups in the first, uh, as a first responsible, such as uh, dissidents, FARC dissidents particularly. Therefore, we create this campaign in order to stop in an interagency uh, coordination effort with the Minister of Environment, of course, with the police, with our army, and with our navy, and with our air force. These operations allow us last year to have a reduction in the 30% of the area to be deforested, which is a great victory, but of course we are not satisfied because still we have a lot of roof, room for improvement. The second activity that is on the Artemis campaign is how our army and our police not only work against these organizations that are creating this uh, deforestation and devastation of the jungle, but also go after all those that are uh, now involved in environmental crimes. Uh, 
uh, we enacted a new law uh, for environmental crimes, and now we have a process for investigation uh, and the whole process for enforcement, um, law enforcement in those areas in order to capture those responsible for these environmental crimes. For the first time, thanks to this effort, some of these guerrilla leaders, such as uh, Gentil Duarte from FARC and also Ivan Mordisco for FARC, they now be, has been judged not only for narco-traffic as, as a terrorist, but also for his uh, crimes against environment. And the third effort has been, I will say, prevention. The Army, uh, the Navy, the Air Force is involved, for example, in supporting the global effort uh, for planting one, uh, 180 million trees that was one of the goals of the government. The Army has been working in those areas where we used to have uh, these guerrillas group and uh, this narco traffic where we have now a state presence planting these trees. Um, we have doing some aerial aspersions of seats by, by, the, by the, our Air Force. And now it's going to be a long-term effort also in order to protect uh, coral reef in the ocean as this one of the places where we definitely have one of the biggest and largest biodiversity uh, in Colombia. This Artemis campaign, campaign has been very successful. Of course, we know that we have a lot of room is, is, is still to go, uh, but now it's part of the mission of our armed forces. We uh, have a, a public force and a, and a military force, which is, has been a, a pioneer in this effort. We will continue in this uh, regard for the future. Um, well, that is an excellent summary on a very important initiative and uh, an indication of the holistic approach Colombia is taking uh, to tackling some of the biggest environmental challenges of our time. And uh, certainly, uh, I noted uh, the use and support of well, Ministry of Defense uh, with the police on law enforcement issues related to the environment, and particularly in areas of the country that are difficult to reach and which are also affected by illegal cultivation, illegal logging, illegal mining. And uh, just on a personal note, I think uh, the coastal area of the Pacific uh, protecting the biodiversity uh, is an extraordinarily important objective. If I can move on to another subject, I know tomorrow you'll be meeting with the Secretary of Defense, uh, uh, Lloyd Austin, and I'm sure you're gonna be building on the March 10th historic announcement by uh, President Duke and President Biden on designation of Colombia as a major non-NATO ally. And as Benjamin laid out, this really is a very um, significant event, has implications for Colombia in the region, but for Colombia as a security partner around the world. Um, and we certainly see that that way. But can I ask uh, if you can elaborate how does Colombia see it in terms of the opportunities it provides uh, the country uh, to deepen its strategic uh, relationships around the world or simply to move forward with some of the objectives uh, that have been outlined on modernism, that you have outlined on modernizing the armed forces, dealing with new threats like cybersecurity? First of all, in the meeting that uh, President Duque had with uh, President Biden, uh, he stressed the importance for Colombia with this new uh, status as a major non-NATO ally for the United States. It represents, first of all, trust. Trust uh, in uh, our relationship that we have done, have done with for more than 200 years. This year, we will, we, will, we will reach 200 years of cooperation. But particularly in the last decades with the Plan Colombia, uh, we have built a relationship that means trust. And it means that we share the same values, um, that we appreciate democracy, we defend freedom, we defend private property, we defend human rights. And of course, uh, for us, it, this, uh, uh, confidence means that we can build, based on our past, good relationship, future 
uh, new activities of cooperations in terms of defense and security. Uh, of course, what we uh, see as an uh, excellent opportunity is three major aspects. One is to go in deep in this uh, still uh, challenge that we have and how to face narco traffic and uh, what uh, it implies for terrorism, not only in the region, but worldwide. The second is, of course, how to deepen uh, the relationship in order to strengthen the capacities of our military forces. We have a very different military forces that we got to know in the at the beginning of the century, thanks to the cooperation with the United States and a tremendous effort by the Colombians. Um, but we see this is an opportunity for long-term programs to strengthen the capacities of our military forces, of our Air Force, our Navy, our Army, but of course, um, all these with these new standards that we, fa the, that we have. And third, of course, is how to build capacities in order to face new challenges si such as cyber security, uh, new challenges for these hybrid threats that we are facing not only in the region but globally. And uh, certainly those threats uh, have been evident in Colombia um, in recent months, the concern with potential cybersecurity attacks on uh, impacting even the electoral process inside the country. And so uh, that cooperation that you're pointing to, and it's important to emphasize it's not just with the United States, it's with NATO. And so it's a building out of capabilities on a much more global stage than uh, Colombia has been on previously. But in that respect, uh, Colombia has been a very significant partner for the United States, but also on its own over the last 10 to 15 years has been engaged in helping build capacity, training in, I don't know, it's at 18, 20 plus countries, uh, not just in the region, but even beyond the region. In other words, the improvements we've seen uh, in uh, the capacity of the Colombian Armed Forces, the reforms over the past 20 years, have led to a professionalization, which can be, um, uh, it, it's an example for the region, but can also be a multiplier for improving security in the region. And I was wondering if perhaps you could comment somewhat, uh, Colombia has been involved on its own, by, uh, on a, bilaterally with the countries in the Central American region, uh, but perhaps comment somewhat on uh, the engagement of uh, Colombian armed forces in helping address rule of law and security capacity building uh, in the region? I will say that in the last two decades in um, Colombia, we became, I will say, as a security regional provider. Uh, in order to not only make our soldiers and our police officers better professional, but also to have better institutions, better capacities, better technology, um, which uh, means that now we are providing technical assistance to other countries in the Central America and Central America, but also in the Caribbean, but in other countries within the region. Uh, and not only, in, I will say in the last years, we entered in a new phase, not only providing technical assistance, but also leading operational efforts, particularly to face narco traffic. And I will mention two examples. We have the Orion campaign. The Orion campaign is an effort led by our Navy which are involving around 23 countries from Central America, from the Caribbean, even from the United States and the Europe, such as uh, uh, Spain, where we are working in an interagency coordination in order to uh, seize cocaine in the Caribbean area, in order to develop interdiction efforts uh, all along our coast in the Pacific and in the Atlantic and the Caribbean Sea, uh, which has been producing very good results. Um, 
and it has done only not only with the cooperation, but also with the training to their officials, exchanging information, and going now through uh, interoperability in our systems in order to work in a better way. And the second initiative is the CEOs campaign. The CEOs campaign also is a quite similar effort, but it has been led by the Air Force. Uh, working with the Caribbean countries and with the Central American countries and the Latin American countries in order to go all after all these uh, air flights routes uh, that they are going with narco traffic uh, from Venezuela or from other countries to the United States or to Europe. These two examples shows how Colombia not only are doing its job against narco traffic, but now are leading regional initiative thanks to the strength uh, that has uh, our military forces and the police. And I'm sure it's an extremely valued partnership, not just for us, but in the region. I do want to touch on what dominates the headlines, frankly dominates um, security concerns in the world today, and that's Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And obviously it's been a significant game changer in terms of balance of power in the world, leading to changes in calculations on how to deal with Russia. There's been much written about how China is looking at the equation, although it formally allied itself with Russia, uh, still looking to see where this conflict ends up. But in much of the rest of the world, um, it's uh, very much a wait and see. I don't think that's any secret. And that's certainly true in Latin America as well. But as we were discussing before uh, we began our conversation here, there are unpredictable impacts of the war in Ukraine on the world, on Latin America in particular. And uh, it, they're economic, uh, uh, down to impacting food production, uh, but perhaps also in terms of security considerations. Uh, either from Colombia's perspective or from what you see in the region, are governments looking at this conflict in Ukraine as something that will impact in the medium term how uh, Latin America and the Caribbean uh, look at engagement with the world going forward? Colombia as part, uh, as a global partner for NATO, we are the only Latin American country global partner of NATO and in words of uh, President Duque, he expressed the importance of uh, to contribute with these values and principles that are promoted by NATO worldwide. And therefore, we have been working uh, within this framework in order to support Ukraine. In the first phase, with humanitarian assistance, is uh, one of the mandates from President Duque that we have implemented and, and channeled through NATO. Uh, but also, uh, we have been working and looking at this as a, as a, as a perspective of security. Uh, so far, mainly looking at what is happening, and of course, it has two major impacts in Colombia. One is uh, for food security and food production for the future, particularly because uh, most of the fertilizers that are coming from this region are uh, a supply uh, really necessary and, and critical for all the food production in Colombia. We have a very productive and, and growing agricultural uh, system um, uh, in, in Colombia, which has been affected, of course. Uh, the government of President Duque is taking decision regarding to this issue, but this is one of the major concerns. And the second one is basically more in terms of geopolitical alignment. Uh, as you may know, for us, Venezuela, but especially the regime of Venezuela um, in certain aspect has uh, uh, support from Russia for the technical assistance, which w for us, in, uh, if this support is provided, the only thing that we have required and expressed by, uh, by, by the, our Chancellor and Minister of Foreign Affairs is that, that none of this support goes to um, protect terrorist group in Venezuela or could be used in order for to affect Colombia. Uh, these two major issues have been the, the issue that we have been discussing uh, and of course uh, the whole time 
President Duque has been very active and very strong in his position about how to have a global order which uh, respect human rights, respect democracy, um, and this is the values that we defend in Colombia. Well, I'm glad you raised Venezuela because that's a, a topic I uh, would also uh, like to hear your comments on. Um, I think, again, uh, it's obvious that there are changes inside the region and how they see what's happening in Venezuela, how to deal with Venezuela going forward, and certainly considerations about how best to support the suspended negotiations in Mexico between the opposition and the Maduro regime, but um, also, obviously, the conflict in Ukraine uh, leading to some rethinking in some places. That said, Colombia is the country that has borne the brunt of the economic collapse of Venezuela and the political repression of political freedoms uh, by Maduro in Venezuela. You're welcome to literally millions of Venezuelans uh, fleeing their country has set an example for the world. And, uh, but the fact is, Colombia still faces an active insurgency that launches from inside Venezuela, the ELN. There's FARC dissident groupings that operate from Venezuelan soil. We have criminal narco-terrorist organizations that operate from inside across the border. And as you've had to work over the past year, and frankly, given your previous work when you were working inside the presidency on sustainable development and reaching out to some of the more remote regions of the country, um, the real issue is how Colombia can address its security in the context of a neighboring country that seems to provide an element of uh, uh, sanctuary for uh, groups which are attacking inside uh, Colombia. So do you see any prospects with the changes we're now beginning to see uh, in terms of uh, dialogue with Venezuela by some countries in the region um, for increasing the focus on Colombia's security requirements along its border, better cooperation on addressing what have been some you know, pretty difficult situations. We've seen the terrorist attacks in Bogota and elsewhere, and uh, it's very important to find a way to address what is a very complex border uh, uh, environment. Venezuela, of course, is, is our, our neighbor, uh, but the problem of Venezuela is the Maduro's regime. Uh, the Maduro's regime uh, destroyed a democracy, destroyed an economic system, uh, and destroyed the social fabric of Venezuela, which produces the largest humanitarian crisis, I will say, in the world after Syria. And uh, Colombia has been a receiver of all these uh, immigrants. 1.8 million of Venezuelans are now in Colombia from the 4 million that are moving all around the region in Latin America. Uh, therefore, a solution must be found, must be found in, in terms of what is going to happen. Um, and of course, uh, we don't pronounce Again, uh, 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 we are very respectful of the decision that any country takes. But what has been critical is two aspects for the future. One is that the Maduro regime needs to be in a transition and a, and a movement from power because it means if he is still in power, he's going to be looking for time in order to continue with this uh, power and is not a strong, is a strengthening democracy or looking at uh, to economic solutions. And of course, of Colombia, any solution that will be discussed uh, must have in consideration that it couldn't be any protection for terrorist group within the Venezuelan soil by the regime. Because what uh, you, what is happening, as you already mentioned, is that in Colombia we have been really active and persistence of in combating and neutralizing and dismantle these terrorist organizations such as ELN or FARC dissidences um, with 
a lot of consequences. And uh, our position has been firm. Uh, we're convinced that the only way to achieve peace and more security in Colombia is through dismantle these terrorist organizations. But they have been moving to Venezuela. Most of the guerrilla leaders of the DCNs, FARC DCNs, and from ELN are located there. They are taking decisions, planning and financing terrorist attacks against Colombia from Venezuelan soil. Uh, therefore, we must act in strengthening our borders and in strengthening the capacity of our forces to defend Colombia, to defend the Colombians, and avoid this violation of human rights by the terrorist groups and, uh, of course, which affect the economics of the frontier uh, and the borders and of also which affect social movements around the world. We recently have in Arauca, which you may know is a department quite in the frontier, a uh, movement of where we have been disputes between ELN and FARC and the uh, military forces in, in, in Venezuela, which produced displacement. More than 5,000 Venezuelans came to Colombia last year. The dispute this year in the other side of Venezuela uh, produces killing between them, uh, internal displacements, uh, homicides, uh, killing of social leaders between the dispute of these two groups in the Venezuelan soil that they look to transfer these disputes in the Colombian um, departments. Uh, therefore, for us, uh, looking at a long-term solution means a transition to democracy in Venezuela, but also n zero tolerance for the protection of terrorist groups in the Venezuelan soil. Now, those are very good points, and I think also um, indicating that this is now having costs for Venezuela on its side of the border with increasing lawlessness, particularly in the border areas, as these groups fight each other and uh, seek to establish their own autonomy. But I think uh, the um, obvious situation along the border leads directly into my next question, which is related to the continuing challenges inside Colombia itself. And uh, the Colombian government across the last two and a half decades has been, or three or four decades, has been carrying out a very significant struggle at times, very successfully at times, less so, um, against drug trafficking groups. And I think it's fair to say we're in one of those moments where some of the drug trafficking groups have grown stronger. And uh, we saw that Colombia continues um, to cooperate with the United States on extradition of key drug lords. And the recent extradition of Otoniel, uh, the head of the Clan del Golfo, um, sparked an expression, an attempt to express force by the Clan del Golfo with the Paro Armado. And we saw, you know, sort of roadblocks. We even saw some killings uh, uh, in that period. Um, and we've also seen how this issue with drug trafficking spills across borders with the murder of the Paraguayan uh, uh, prosecutor Marcelo Pecci in his uh, honeymoon in Cartagena. I know that there has been a strong coordinated effort by uh, police and military forces to respond to the increased activity of drug trafficking groups, but I was wondering if you could comment on how you see where things stand now in the context of the extradition of Otoniel, in the context of uh, the actions you are now taking against the Clan del Golfo. And um, it, 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 I think it's important to note this isn't necessarily a return to what Colombia lived in the 1980s. It's a different phenomenon, but it also uh, requires a strong state response to ensure citizen security. In Colombia, when President Duque took office, we have more or less between 13,000, a little bit less of people uh, in arms or supporting these groups. And we have around six major um, illegal armed groups. Mm -hmm. Now we have around 11,000 
of these people in those groups, and only three major uh, uh, armed groups in Colombia. We have been combating, dismantling all these organizations with the force uh, and the work done by our militaries and the police. They still are there because narco-traffic. Narco-traffic is the major threat, not only for Colombia, but, but the whole region. Narco-traffic in Colombia and in Latin America means uh, homicides, means internal displacement, means violation of human rights. It means assassination of social leaders. This is what we have seen in Colombia for the FARC dissidences, for ELN, and for Clan del Golfo. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we combat them with determination and with, uh, with uh, definitely a, a discipline in order to, to defend our democracy. And this is happening in the region. Therefore, we are committed to combat narco traffic and to dismantle this, this crime that is really affecting human rights, our livelihood conditions, and et cetera. But the, unfortunately, President Duque received a country with the plantations and the, co the coke area growing at a fast speed. We received more or less 173,000 hectares of coca. We stopped the growing. We now reduce the area, and we are doing effort in eradication. We destroyed, in this period of time, more or less 20,000 laboratories. Last year, we seized around 700 uh, tons of coca, the, the largest seize campaign that we have in the last 10 years. Um, but still, there is a lot of work to do against to combat narco traffic, and it requires international cooperation because this is not a business only that satisfies or, or, or the, the criminal activities, but also is affecting democracy, is strengthening those groups, which they, they don't not only have the interest of on illegal money, but they have the interest of um, create uh, uh, unstable democracies in the region, and of course promoting the alignment of some of the democracies more close to other uh, ideologies that we have been traditional are uh, also against, uh, against, for example, with the value that we promote together with the United States and Colombia. Um, but the third is that, of course, for us, now the challenge is, such as the Clan del Golfo, is that he, the phenomenon has been mutating. And uh, Clan del Golfo with Otoniel, that is the worst drug dealer, I will say only comparable to Paul Escobar, and I will say worst, um, because he built this organization that not only sent the coca abroad, mm -hmm. but they took the excess or the, the coca um, that is left in order to promote what we call micro-traffic, providing coca to the kids on the streets, to the kids close to the schools, and of course destroying the environment through the laboratories, and they use this in order to, to, to have power. And those groups of micro-traffic, and uh, those groups that, uh, of course, uh, has this political and local powers are looking to influence elections to, have, uh, to create um, uh, threats to the populations, and therefore we combat them because we know it's not only the international part of narco-traffic, but also is this micro-traffic that is affecting the future for our kids, is affecting our environment, is violating human rights. This guy, Otoniel, uh, he is uh, the worst human rights violator uh, for children and girls, uh, for social leaders. Uh, he, was, um, he, he paid for kill our policemen. Uh, and he looked now recently after he was extradited. Uh, they tried to create these uh, movements uh, with blockades and all these, but in four days we control the areas, we have the presence of our military force, our police, and we capture 120 of them that now are in the jail thanks to the work and the effort of our police, and we will do it. Uh, and of course it's not easy because they look to control and they use the power of this micro-traffic and these crimes, but of course in Colombia we are really committed to in order to enact and to enforce law and to provide security for our people. I think the point you make about the mutation of the business is um, extremely important and it gets lost in a lot of the uh, 
coverage and focus on the challenges Colombia is facing because you can also look at Central America, you can look at what's happening in Mexico, you can look at what's happening in Ecuador, and it really is a, a change in the dynamic on the ground. And certainly, uh, as you're explaining, uh, the micro-traffic aspect of this isn't just the trafficking, it's hooking in local consumption for new generations, it's attempting to influence politics, perhaps not at the national level, but at local levels, which makes it much more difficult to build the process of peace uh, inside uh, Colombia. And, uh, and you uh, quite rightly point out that the proliferation of laboratories, the impact on the environment, very, very uh, significant. But is there, have you sensed an opportunity to speak to some of the other countries in the region that are facing these challenges of increased production and a changing dimension to drug trafficking um, about developing a, a more energetic, coordinated regional approach, or that's for the future? Definitely. Recently, we have a summit uh, that uh, was called by the Colombian police uh, bringing together the police of the regions, and we launched a new initiative that is called the Emerald uh, Initiative Against Narco Traffic. And this new uh, initiative uh, learned from the past activities against narco traffic and built for the future. This initiative introduced a work together with the other countries, for example, in micro traffic control, because now that we are facing in most of our cities is these micro traffic groups that became in a vicious circle, I will say. They start to provide the coca or what we call uh, marijuana or also the, um, that, the, that in Colombia are all type of even chemicals. Uh, and the, it creates a vicious cycle of crimes, uh, first for, for uh, gangs, and then they became part of these illegal groups. This, that's why the, we are not only facing this in Colombia. This is also that has been faced in, in Guatemala, in Salvador, in Peru. We have seen this phenomenon. That's why this is a new approach. And the second one is about cyber crimes. Most of the coca in the cities are now are traded by WhatsApp groups, or they have been traded by the social networks. And these new phenomenon, we have been very concerned and act and, and creating plans and programs in order to control these new phenomena. So I know this isn't the direct subject of our conversation today, but I just want to acknowledge the work you've done throughout most of your career, working on social issues, developing uh, uh, alternative crop uh, crops for uh, cultivation um, in uh, remote areas of Colombia, the work you did in the presidency with DAPRE in addressing uh, the broader sustainable uh, development questions for vulnerable populations. And I think, uh, I'm sure you would agree that a very important component of what you're doing in the Ministry of Defense is ensuring that there is a very strong engagement uh, with uh, populations in these areas that are suffering um, from drug trafficking, from uh, other acts of violence, uh, to have these programs of engagement with local communities? Um, at that time, we learned from this uh, concept of interagency cooperation. And uh, we now defend and work for a security policy uh, that allows economic investment to grow in those areas. We work for, with a security policy that allows to social investment in roads, in... Uh, agricultural projects uh, can grow in those areas affected by the presence of these illegal armed groups. And we have been very successful. And at that time, we demonstrated that it was possible, thanks to the United States Cooperation, USID, we managed to transform uh, and to go from around 170,000 hectares for coca right. to less than 50,000. Mm -hmm. And this alternative development allow us to cultivate more or less 36,000 uh, areas in, in, in cacao, uh, in more than 60,000 hectares of uh, coffee. 
uh, and to create this new um, possibility for the oil palm to grow in those areas that previously were affected by. And now these are really prosperous people now committed in, in the legality uh, and it has been very successful and we defend this and we have been working in, the, in, in, in our Minister of Defense, even our Air Force, he has his, our general working with us. Uh, they have a very successful project for cacao in Bichada, which is in the border with Venezuela, thanks to this group. We defend this because we, we believe that the only way to ensure sustainability in those areas is with security, more economic investment, and more social investment. So if I uh, can turn to another topic, which uh, has received a lot of coverage here, um, certainly over the past uh, year, year and a half, and it's the concerns about human rights violations. And uh, we've seen them on different levels. Uh, there were the, uh, how the police reacted to uh, the widespread protests in the summer of 2021, and particularly in Cali. And uh, you know, more recently, we've seen the testimony of uh, former military officers involved in the Falsos Positivos campaign and the hearings held by the uh, JEP, the special tribunal created to look at war crimes of the past. I think it is important for our audience to understand that it's not simply uh, what government forces did that's being looked at. Uh, the JEP has also uh, recommended eight senior FARC secretariat officials uh, with war crimes. Uh, but uh, I know uh, it's, uh, these, these testimonies have uh, had quite an impact, also in Colombia, not just uh, obviously from outside. President Duque talked about them being estremecedor, um, shocking, and uh, acknowledging the need for, welcoming the need for historic ac uh, accountability. But in the last few weeks, there was also the incident in Puerto Leguizamo, Puerto Mayo, um, which uh, left more than a dozen dead as security forces uh, uh, responded to what they uh, saw as threats from armed groups and traffickers in the region. Um, it, I think it is uh, notable that the Colombian government um, responds to these issues by being willing to work with independent prosecutions, investigations uh, into the incidents, into the history. And, uh, but perhaps uh, you could explain in greater detail how the Colombian government is responding to the challenge, not just of ensuring accountability, but taking steps to ensure that uh, you know, incidents are minimized in the future. Um, as uh, these challenges will remain. I mean, there is the threat of these armed groups, of the drug trafficking groups, and the importance of uh, creating uh, space for people to act without feeling the threat of violence. And your ministry plays a central part in making sure that's the case. The Colombian government and the military forces and our armed forces and the police are committed to human rights. Uh, not only because it's in our constitution, but it's in the foundations or the values and the principles and the doctrine of the military forces and the police. And I, I will try to mention and to tackle the three issues that you mentioned. Let's speak about what happened in the riots and the blockades mm -hmm. in, in the year 2021 in, in April. Our constitutions mandate to protect the social process, and we do it daily. This is what the police and the armed forces do every day, because this is a right to protect and to have a pacific protest. But what happened in Colombia is a mixture, and we have to differentiate. Between April and July in the year 2021, we have 15,000 pacific protests in Colombia. 15,000, and the police protect all of them and allow to go to do it. Of course, it could be because social unrest and social demands and our, our mission, our responsibility to protect them. In 1,500 cases, we don't have pacific protests. We have violent activities against the law or against the Constitution. In those activities, we act with the police, enforce, with law enforcement. This is what the police did. And of course, some of these, in some, they, we have some K-9 
cases about uh, about the operations that has been investigated, and we already have results about it. Uh, but we protect the right to protest in Colombia as is stated in the Constitution. But of course, any actions against the law. And I will say just one activity. Can you imagine here in the United States that a group of civilians stopped the moving in I-95? What is the police going to do? They are going to allow them to stay there forever, like uh, violating rights of others? Uh, putting at risk of food security for, for the whole nation or when they destroyed a metro. Just one example. In these violent activities, some of these uh, persons destroy 41 stations of our Transmillennium. Transmillennium is like the metro of the New York City. Right. When you destroy a metro station, don't suppose the police to act. When you want to take over the Congress, here you have the discussion in the Congress when uh, civilians took over the Congress and they were put in jail, some of them. This is what happened in some of these activities in Colombia. They wanted to take our Congress or our, our Justice Palace. In those issues, police must act and enforce law. This is different to protest to, to, for, for a pacific protest. Of course, if any violated, we have zero tolerance with any behavior from our soldier or our police against the Constitution, and they have been investigated. And of course, we have more than 36 cases that now are in the uh, prosecuted office, and we are collaborating with them because we need results, and we are, we are going to be very strong against any that um, committed any crimes in the law or do doesn't respect the Constitution within the force. This is one issue. But even though this year we enacted three laws in order to increase the standard for the police, we have a new professionalization law that requires for all the policemen every five years an assessment to evaluate their competences and their knowledge on human rights, use of force, and uh, police services and procedures. If they don't accomplish and they don't uh, fulfill these uh, assessments and they pass, uh, they're going to have a second opportunity, otherwise they're going to be get out of the force. We are going to be becoming more strict. We have a good police, but we are going to have a better police for better security for the Colombia. This is the case of the protest. In the case of HEP, with, uh, that they, what has been called the, the falsos positivos, or the case of Putumayo, I will say that there is none police of soldier that had not, has not been educated in our armed forces. 400,000 police and, 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 and soldiers has been trained, educated, and evaluated in human rights. We, haven't, we have done this in the last decade. And of course, we are providing all the training, uh, the, the investigations um, for all the process that we, we found, but definitely, this is a force that trained people in practice. Just for Colombia, the Colombian army is the only um, country and armed force uh, which trains their soldiers in the field and how to respect the human rights. In Tolemaida, that this right. is one of the, the largest military base, we have a trail where we train the soldiers how to act, how to act uh, if you find an indigenous community, how to act if you have to face an issue with social leaders, how to act in a military operation when you have, for example, social disorders or you have the civilian presence. This is the only one. We have 12 uh, stations in how to train them in different human rights possibilities where they have to take decisions on how to act in a military or a police oper a military operation particularly. We are really committed. And um, now we are part of OTAN, and NATO. Uh, in NATO, we are raising our standards and in our operations, uh, really committed to, to human rights and, and international um, uh, law uh, standards. And, and, and finally, of course, with, with the HEP, uh, and of course, all the, we, we are expecting uh, the results of the different investigation, but just, let, just for you to know, all these officials, that they were part in this process of HEP, they were already captured by our army 
and they were in jail after, be, before they go to HEP. It means the government and the, the state act against them because they violated the law. Now they have a new opportunity in HEP. Uh, but it means that we are not, uh, we don't, uh, we, will, we, will, we will not allow any impunity um, in any of our officers. Uh, and, and, uh, and of course, is uh, for the future, we are really working on to increase the standards and we're really committed uh, for this because this is the only way to have legitimacy in our, in our armed forces. And this is the mandate from President Duque. This is the mandate from the Minister of Defense to the forces. We are really committed because the legitimacy of, of the forces is based on our respect for human rights. Well, thank you very much for such an open and forthright response. And I think it is important for audiences to look at the history of what the Colombian government has done uh, when you uh, examine through a historical lens what things were like in the 1990s and into the early 2000s, and the very significant advances there have been in strengthening the judiciary, uh, strengthening accountability, um, professionalizing and modernizing uh, the armed forces, the actions of the police. And clearly, uh, there's still a lot of work to do, and the government and uh, the institutions are committed to continuing to work them. So I think uh, your uh, your words, I think, are a uh, very, very important uh, perspective on the issues that are very complex uh, that face Colombia. I'd like to close because we're reaching the end of our hour here. Um, but And I know you cannot talk a word about the political situation in Colombia at the moment and the electoral process. But I do note that today you announced Fase Dos, of the uh, support uh, for Plan Democracia, democracy plan. In other words, the very sustained engagement of the police and the armed forces uh, to ensure that the presidential elections, which are forthcoming, go forward smoothly. And I would like to note for um, our audience that already uh, the congressional elections earlier this year went forward smoothly with all sides accepting uh, the results. And, uh, but it's certainly of note what you announced in terms of a very significant plan, deployment of personnel to protect candidates, to protect over 12,000 polling stations across the country, uh, to focus on preventing cyber attacks. And uh, it's uh, notable um, in terms of a commitment to ensuring the democratic process goes forward. But I don't know if you can share any of the details on this, but uh, this, is, uh, this, this is something you also did for the elections earlier this year, right? There is this commitment to ensuring that the electoral process works. We launched the second phase of democracy plan uh, based on our first phase. In the first phase, we managed to have the most peaceful elections in the last 45 years uh, with 17 events, most of them because climate activities which affect the, the, the polling uh, tables or, or, or polls. Uh, but even we managed to elect for the first time six, 16 victims as a congressman representing the most areas affected by violence and now they are going to be part of our Congress. Secondly, we are going to have this second phase with this democracy plan. Half of our force are going to be deployed in the country to protect 12,000 uh, polling stations. They are going to protect all the candidates with all our maximum capacities in order that they, they can campaign all around the country. We are going to protect the results and we're going to protect the right of the Colombians to vote freely. And all of us respect this democracy that is strength our, our, our institutions as our, and our democracy. Well, thank you again for your time. Uh, and certainly uh, from the perspective of an American sitting in Washington, I look forward to the relationship between our countries, both at the strategic level, at the people-to-people -people level, and at the economic level, continues to strengthen. And I'm hoping uh, uh, whatever government is elected continues uh, to uh, sustain that commitment because the relationships between us transcend politics. 
and I hope we can continue to build on the work that uh, we've done over the past couple of decades. Ambassador McKinley, thanks a lot. And to the Wilson Center, I would like to thank again on behalf of all, of all the Colombians and all our people from the Colombian Armed Forces. Thank you so much again.